Hi everyone, my name is Paola Martinez Montes and I'm the Invest in San Diego Families Campaign Manager. I am going to be providing some information to those, of, uh, those who are joining us and need Spanish translation. Hola a todos, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Paola Martinez Montes y soy eh, la manager de la campaña Invest, Invertir en, San, en las Familias de San Diego. Si necesitan traducción, este, 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 esta presentación se, se va a traducir. Eh, para empezar, para, para ustedes que necesiten traducción en español, por favor llamen al teléfono que ven en pantalla. Les piden, pedirán un número de identificación que también aparece en su pantalla. Después de que, de que oprima ese número en su teléfono, oprima la señal de gato y entrará a la, a la presentación con su teléfono. Podrá seguir la presentación aquí y escucharla por su teléfono. Next slide. So again, welcome everybody to the ISDF Town Hall. Like I said before, my name is Paola Martinez Montes and we are very happy to host you all and share a, a bit more about the work that we are doing and how we do that work and the, you know, what this budget cycle will be uh, with the, at the county. At the county. Um, next slide. So our agenda for today is going to be focused on sharing a little bit about who Invest in San Diego Families is. So you all um, hear a little bit about the work that we've done so far. Um, we'll get to learn about the role of county government. We'll hear from uh, our panelists on or our presenters on what the Board of Supervisors historic priorities have been and a little on their, the, their hall of shame. We'll also hear about what the county's response to COVID-19 has looked like. And we'll end by talking about what's at stake and what it's going to take to move and win um, resources, important resources that our communities need and have been needing for a very long time. Next slide. So to get started and to share a little bit about who Invest in San Diego Families is, I am going to be introducing Sean Ilo Rivera, who is uh, the executive director at Youth Will, and you'll be hearing from uh, different presenters who are all partners of Invest in San Diego Families. Sean. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really, really glad to see um, such an incredible turnout. Um, 155 people already, that's really awesome. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background about who Invest in San Diego Families is and, and what we do. Um, I'm really proud to be, uh, uh, to have Youth Will be a part of this, this coalition and I'm, I'm excited to dive in and to the next slide. So we're made up of uh, a large group of nonprofit organizations and social justice organizations uh, and, and the la labor organizations that are fighting for a better community here in, in San Diego. Um, the, the logos are all there on the screen, but what I will say is that I've had the good fortune of being a part of this coalition and participating in this for uh, several years now and to see it grow uh, into the inclusive, um, wide-ranging group that it, that it is um, is, is really an, an incredible thing. And I think uh, is really indicative of the, the, type of, um, the type of community work that we're going to need where we're banding together across different ethnic groups, around different racial groups, or different interest areas in order to make sure that San Diego communities are being, being served as they need to. So um, I'll walk through the different names. Um, ACE, uh, San Diego Organizing Project, SEIU 221, um, and it's showing up a little bit strange on my screen, um, Planned Parenthood, the San Diego LGBT Center, um, sorry y'all, uh, Youth Will, that's us, the Center on Policy Initiatives, Mid-City Can, Business for Good San Diego, the ACLU, the Chicano Federation, Employee Rights Center, EHC, and the San Diego Hunger Coalition, um, and then lo uh, local at CIU 221. Uh, next slide, please. So 
one of the things that we take a lot of pride in is advocating for uh, programs, policies, and services to uh, to ensure that that uh, invest in staying with families um, is covering all the areas that need to be covered in order to reach our goal of making sure that the the county of San Diego is properly investing in our communities. What we'd seen over in the past was that um, very often um, we were not having the the sort of investment. Um. Yeah, I guess Sean Adam, so I can cover this slide if you all would like. Well, Sean, yeah, Sean, that's Sean. perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Watson. I'm with Youth Will. Um, so I'm gonna just go over this slide. Um, okay, so um, ISDF um, advocates for programs, policies, and services in five different, or rather, oh yeah, five different areas. And I'm gonna just um, go through them really quick. So the first one is um, transparency and accountability. Um, so when we say transparency and accountability, um, the first thing that I want to emphasize is that the budget is our tax dollars, right? It's our money. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't belong to the county, it belongs to the people. And I think Angelina will go more over the budget later on, but I just want to emphasize that first. Um, therefore, if the money that the county is in control of is our money, we should know what is being spent on, um, what like what programs is going into, right? Is a lot of it going to public safety? Are they is it going to the sheriff, or is it going to services, for example, in health and human services that our community needs? The first thing is to ensure that the community knows um, where the money is being spent on, and that's the transparency part, right? Um, and once we know how the money is being allocated and what it's being spent on, we have the um, that um, the ability, right, to hold them accountable and make sure that they are facing the consequences of their actions um, if the money is not being spent to serve our communities. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is to ensure, um, um, what is it called, through transparency and accountability, we can also ensure that the budget is being spent in an equitable and fair way. Um, so I also wanted to include that. Um, and then I'm going to go into the next one. The next one is good jobs. So the first thing is, I believe that every person should have, um, who's, who has a job should have a um, livable wage. Um, nobody should be working every day of their life, um, working hard, and then still be struggling to pay rent or to buy food and so on and so forth. Therefore, um, we advocate for good jobs and make sure that our community is taken care of and everyone has access to jobs, livable wage, but also that they have access to benefits just as healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, and other benefits th through their work. Um, not only that, but to ensure that the county staff who are providing some of these services are paid well, well as well. Um, and that's um, departments just, as, just um, as those under health and human services that provide resources for our community are well staffed. So for example, if somebody needs housing assistance um, or any other service, um, they shouldn't be like being continued like being on hold or like struggling to get hang of someone because our county um, dep services, service departments are not well staffed. So that's also crucially important. The third um, area is the safety ladder. And I think there's a lot that falls under this, right? So when we say safety ladder is, providing basic services, basic human rights for our San Diego community to ensure that um, everyone in San Diego has everything that they need to be happy, healthy, and successful um, and to reach their potential, right? So for example, does that, that includes um, support and services in healthcare, in housing, in food, and so on and so forth. Um, for example, in housing, if you don't have a roof over your head, then how are you supposed to feed your family? How are you supposed to feel safe? How are you supposed to be, you know, like, you know, like a member of the community, like where when you're living on the streets, right? So to make sure that our community is taken care of and everyone has access to the basics that they need in order to be successful and survive, um, we advocate for those basic needs, which is what falls under safety ladder. The fourth um, area is um, smart justice. As a lot of you know, our current system right now is um, um, punitive based, is focused on pun punishing rather than assist the people who need help. Um, and I also think it's crucially important 
that always when we work in the justice system that we we approach everything from a racial equity lens right um, we cannot advocate for a better or an improved um, justice system without acknowledging the systemic racism and acknowledging the disproportionality of people of color in the system the fact that you know like black people especially are disproportionately represented we cannot um, address the system without um, you know having that racial equity focus at first so that's the first thing um, so when we talk about justice system is we're talking about moving away from again a punishment pace to ensuring that um, we are providing other other uh, other resources just as mental health resources education um, program programs for people who are coming out of the system and coming back to the community and making sure that they need everything that everything in order to integrate back, back into the community and be successful members of our community right so that is um that fits under the smart justice portion um yeah so for, so yeah for example i want to emphasize the mental health part right if somebody needs mental health services they shouldn't be in in, in jail um so i wanted to point that out the last portion the last area is immigration um acknowledging the fact that we are a border county we serve a bi-national community um and that in, that means taking care of our immigrant community whether that is providing you know translation of services in budget hearings or in um, county programs but also ensuring that our immigrant community is safe that includes our undocumented um, community members um, so that's the last area and on that note, I'm going to pass it back to Sean. Thanks, Sean. You are muted, Sean. Uh, thank you for being uh, the, the safety net um, for me, Orson. I really appreciate that. That was um, a massive technology fail over here for me. Um, so sorry, everyone. So um, if we can move on to the next slide. Um, I think this is the last one for, for me. Um, we just want to talk about a bit about what we've done so far. Um, I, I mentioned before, um, you know, what a what a what pride I have in in just kind of having been a part of all the work that um, ISDF has done over the years, and it's really been an incredible thing to see. That photo that you see on the uh, uh, right now is indicative of the sort of community power um, that has been built. So when we when we started this work six years ago. Um, the, the county budget hearings only happened in the morning. The whole meeting lasted about 20 minutes and almost no one outside the county had any idea how our money was being spent. Uh, even reporters weren't showing up. And this is a multi-billion dollar budget. San Diego is California's second biggest county. And all of this was happening behind closed doors without any community involvement. But our coalition pushed to make the budget more transparent and accessible. First, we demanded that the county hold evening budget hearings. So working people, young people, um, uh, folks from, from the community could actually participate um, in, in, the, in, the, in the hearings. Um, and a few years ago, we had over a thousand people show up. Um, and we hope that you'll actually help us beat that number this year. Um, it really does make a difference. And um, our coalition has worked via budgeting and through SEIU's contract bargaining process to fight for a budget that supports the health and well-being of San Diego families not just the needs of the rich and powerful as it was before. And through this work, we've gotten reporters to start covering the county, which is really, really important. They're shining a light on some of, on some of, the, um, some of the ways that the county was hoarding money, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. Um, and um, we've also been able to shift how some of the money is spent. And while it's not enough, we have gotten the county to spend more money on health and human services, put money into creating affordable housing by putting $25 million in an affordable housing trust fund two years in a row for over uh, a total of over $50 million. So this work has really, really made a difference. I think that ISDF is just uh, being started. And I appreciate again, everyone uh, for, for um, uh, participating here with us tonight. And I will hand it over to Belin from Mid City Camp. Hi, good evening, everybody. Buenas tardes. First, we would like to hear from you and your experience with the county. We have a poll for you. 
So please go ahead and answer the questions appearing on your screen. Great. Yes, I hope everybody can see it. First, how big is the county budget? What's your guess? Or maybe you know. 5 million, 50 million, 3.5 billion, or 6.2 billion. And second, what is the county government responsible for? Social services, such as Medi-Cal, CalWORKs, et cetera, ensuring that elections run, providing funding for the sheriff's department, or all of the above. Yes, I see answers coming in. Keep responding. Awesome, we're gonna give a couple more seconds. Put in your responses. All right, a couple more seconds. Great, let's see, five more seconds. Get your response in, five, four, three, two, one, closing poll. Awesome, can you see the results there? Wonderful, you all seem like a very informed crowd. That is correct, the majority of you said the county budget is 6.2 billion. And yes, it is a large budget. These are taxpayer dollars and other grants coming in. And we need to have a voice on deciding how these funds are utilized. And the county government, correct, is responsible for all these things, social services, elections, and public safety. So this is uh, why it's, it's important for us to stay informed. Uh, we can go into the next slide. Great, so this is our Board of Supervisors. It's composed of five members. District one is represented by Greg Cox. Uh, he represents South Bay, so Chula Vista, National City, Imperial Beach, Coronado, San Isidro, Time Mesa, Southern portions of the city of San Diego, like Barrio Logan. And then there's Diane Jacob, District two. She represents East County, uh, so El Cajon, La Mesa, Lemon Grove, Poway and Santee uh, and some unincorporated areas. Um, and about these two um, supervisors, they have been in office. Greg Cox was elected in 1995 and Diane Jacobs in 1997. So for approximately 25 years, their seats have not changed and both seats are up for re-election this year. Uh, so we're, we're, um, it's important for you to vote inform yourselves and go and decide who you think should be sitting at the Board of Supervisors representing the area that you live in. D representing District 3 is Kristen Gaspar. She was elected in 2018 and she represents communities in North Coastal San Diego. Uh, so parts of City of San Diego, Mira Mesa, Rancho Bernardo, Tierra Santa, Del Mar, Encinitas, uh, other parts of Escondido. And she is closing up her first term. So she's also up for re-election this year. And then in District 4, we have Nathan Fletcher, uh, Central Parts of San Diego. And in District 5, we have Jim Desmond representing North County. So Oceanside, Carlsbad, San Marcos, Camp Pendleton, and some inland unincorporated communities. On the board, uh, we've seen uh, that Nathan Fletcher has been more uh, inclined to work for the issues that our community cares about, and sometimes Diane Jacob. But other than that, it's very difficult to have these people listen to our concerns. So your vote really matters, and we hope that you will stay engaged uh, through November to select the right people to be there and represent you. So we can go on to the next slide. Aside from the board, it's also important to be familiar with the Chief Administrative Officer, the CAO. Her name is Helen Robbins Mayer, and she is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the county. So the board will usually pass policy, but the, cow, the CAO will manage the staff that puts the budget together, 
a balanced budget. Um, where will we take some money from and where will we put that money? Uh, she is appointed by the supervisors and she has a lot of say as to what will be the priorities for the next fiscal year. So now to go more in depth about the county budget, I would like to leave you with Angelina Corsani, research and policy advocate at the Center on Policy Initiatives. Thank you, Belen. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk to you all a bit about the county budget. Um, the county budget is a really important document. Um, it's not just a financial document. It's a moral document and a policy document that reflects the priorities of those supervisors that you all just heard about. And because the county government is a subdivision of the state, the county budget covers a lot of different things. The county does have to provide state and federally funded programs like Section 8 housing vouchers and foster care. The county is also responsible for regional services like public safety and public health services for the county. Um, and then the county also provides municipal services to unincorporated areas. Um, there are 18 cities within the county, but any area of land that's not part of a city is called an unincorporated area. So because those areas don't have a city government to provide city services like road maintenance and sewer system maintenance, um, th for those areas, the county steps in and provides those services instead. So the county budget, which last year was a total of $6.25 billion, covers a lot because it provides all of those services for a population of 3.3 million and we are the second largest county in the state. So it's a lot of services for a lot of people. Next, next slide, please. So the way that the county provides all of those services, excuse me. Sorry, the way that the county provides all of those services is through five different operating groups. Each of those groups provides a certain type of services and then within the larger groups, there are multiple departments that provide more, a more specific set of services. And the county budget is also split among those five operating groups. Um, the two largest groups are Health and Human Services, which I might refer to as HHSA sometimes, but HHSA and Public Safety. Each of those receive about $2 billion of the total budget or about a third of the county's total budget. The land use and environment group receives about $652 million or 10.4% of the total budget. And the finance and general government group receives about 729 million, um, almost 12% of the total budget. There is also another 8.8% or 500, about 500 million, 50 million of the total budget that goes to other categories. But um, these four operating groups that provide county services make up about 90% of the total county budget. So it's what we tend to focus on. Um, a little bit more about each group. Um, Health and Human Services Group, or HHSA, is the largest group in the county budget. It provides a lot of different services. So most of those state and federally funded programs are provided by this group. Um, and that includes Section 8 housing vouchers, any other rental assistance programs, child welfare services, foster care, services for seniors and older adults, um, mental health services for individuals who are unsheltered or who might have substance abuse issues, also therapy for them and their families. Um, this group also does enrollment in programs like CalFresh, Medi-Cal, and CalWorks. Um, and that's just some of what they do. So you can see that this group is responsible for a lot um, and also the programs and services that we hear a lot about from community members that are most important to community are usually provided by this group, Health and Human Services. Public safety, like I said, is the other major group or the second largest group. Um, within that is included fire and emergency medical services, administration of local jails and juvenile halls, uh, policing by the sheriff's department, the district attorney's office is in there, public defender's office, probation department, animal services, child support services. And then within the land use environment group, that includes public works for those unincorporated non-city areas, so maintenance of roads, sewer systems for those places, 
Um, it also includes maintenance of parks, golf courses, recreational programs at parks. Um, this group is also responsible for building permitting and inspections. Um, and the county library system is also in there. Um, the finance and general government group is sort of like an administrative group. Um, included in there are the board of supervisors, their salaries, their staff, the treasurer, tax collector, um, grand jury, legal services for the county. The CAO is included in there. Um, administration of county contracts, ensuring all county departments have the workplaces, materials, vehicles, et cetera, they need to function. Um, and then also the registrar of voters uh, that administers elections is included in that group. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when it comes to advocacy around the county budget, it can be helpful, I think, to understand some key terms. And two terms you should be familiar with are general purpose revenue and program revenue. Those are two different types of revenue that have different rules and restrictions on how they can be used, um, but you can still do advocacy around both types of revenue. Um, a little program revenue. There was about $3.1 billion of program revenue in the last year's budget. This type of revenue is mostly from state and federal grants. Um, a lot of the health and human services budget is program revenue. Um, one important thing to know about program revenue is that it has to be used for the specific programs that it's assigned to. Um, and again, that's important because when you're advocating, you should know that there are significant chunks of money that have to be spent on certain things or programs. But um, that doesn't mean there isn't work to be done there or you can't push your supervisors to change something that is funded by program revenue. Um, so even though that money might need to be spent on a specific program, that's still a fairly broad restriction because there's a lot that goes into a program, like how many staff are hired to provide that program, what type of training staff receive, how the program is evaluate, evaluated, and how outreach to residents so they know about the program and whether they qualify is done. So there's a lot of advocacy that's possible and needed to continue and change um, county programs that are funded by program revenue. Um, I also wanted to talk about general purpose revenue, which is the focus of this slide. The fiscal year 20 budget had about, so that was last year's budget, had about $1.4 billion of general purpose revenue. Um, this type of revenue is mostly from property taxes and other types of local taxes. So about 84% of, of that 1.4 billion comes from local property taxes. An important thing to know about general purpose revenue is that it can be used for anything. So it can be used for any type of county expenditure that the supervisors decide to make. And general purpose revenue is super important to know about because this is a large amount of money that can be spent on almost anything that your supervisors have the power to make decisions about. And like I said, this is literally mostly local tax dollars, so it's actually your money. If you look at the graph on the slide, you can see how your money is being spent. Um, what I see when I look at this graph is that general purpose revenue is disproportionately spent on what the county calls public safety. So of the 1.4 billion of general purpose revenue in last year's budget, 56% um, was allocated to the public safety group. That's um, a 790 million. And while 56% went to public safety, quote unquote, only 9.6% was allocated for health and human services. I do wanna say that some of the reason behind that is because the county gets a lot of state and federal revenue for health and human services programs. That's the program revenue I was mentioning earlier. But I, it's clear and I, I do wanna emphasize that local tax dollars, so general purpose revenue where the county supervisors have discretion on how it's spent is disproportionately spent on when, what the county calls public safety. Next slide, please. And for this last slide, I just wanna show a little bit about what public safety spending means to the county right now. A quick note about the graph on the slide, it does represent the full public safety budget, not just general purpose. Okay, 
Am I muted? We can hear you now, Angelina. Okay. Uh, what was the last thing that you all heard? I don't remember exactly. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to. I just, I'll just restart my spiel about this slide. Yeah, that'd be good. And, and actually, if you could please go slower, Angelina, for the translator to catch up, that would be good too. Absolutely, sorry about that. I will slow down. Um, so for this last slide, I wanted to show a little bit about what public safety spending means to the county right now. Um, and a quick note that the graph on this slide represents the full public safety budget and not just general purpose revenue. So it's the full $2.1 billion that's allocated for this group. Of that 2.1 billion, 47% goes directly to the sheriff's department and 10.2% goes directly to the district attorney's office. So that means that almost 60% of this group's money, about $1.2 billion, goes directly to policing, incarceration, and prosecution. You can see how little money is spent on public defenders, which people are supposed to be able to rely on to defend them in court, and how little is spent on probation, which is supposed to help people who are exiting incarceration as they're trying to rebuild their lives. So it's undeniable when you look at this graph um, because regardless of what the county supervisors might say, the numbers don't lie. It's undeniable that the county's definition of public safety equates to policing people, prosecuting people, and putting people in jail. And to me, that is not public safety, especially when our country's criminal justice system is broken and rooted in anti-Blackness and racism. The county's investments right now actually put people in danger more than it keeps them safe. We all know research and data show that our criminal justice system disproportionately harms black people, people of color and low income communities. So for me, these investments are and choices are extremely concerning. Um, what I wanna leave you with is a reminder that a budget is a moral document that reflects the priorities and choices of your elected officials. And a good budget should also reflect the values of the community that it serves. So my question for you all is, does this budget reflect your values and priorities? Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Angelina. So we're, we're going to stop here for just a, a few minutes to give you all an opportunity to ask some questions from Angelina. I know we just covered a lot, Angelina or, or um, Belen, in terms of the role of county government. So um, why don't you all put some questions in the chat. If we're only going to answer a couple questions in this, in this section, but we do want to um, let you know that we'll, we're going to have an opportunity to continue to re, um, respond to your questions at the end, towards the end of the, the presentation. So uh, if, you, if, you do not, if we do not get to your question here, we'll, we'll have a chance to answer it um, down below. So if you could send us some questions regarding budget um, or county government, like the role of county government, put them in the chat now. And can we go back to the previous slide, please? So people can see. Thank you. Angelina, a few folks are asking questions about the sheriff's department and the breakdown of um, how that money is spent. And there's some requests to maybe go over um, the last uh, two slides, if you could, um, to, re to maybe respond to some of these questions. Would you be able to do that for us? Just take a couple minutes to do that and then we can move from this section into the next. And again, keep sending your questions and we'll answer them the, um, towards the, down below. Yeah, okay, I will do my best. Um, I see someone ask, what is included in the Public Safety Executive Office? That's a great question because you can see it's a hefty chunk, 20.5%. Um, 
so the answer, the best answer I have to that is that we don't know. Um, if you look at the page in the budget that describes the Public Safety Executive Office, there's not a lot of detail about what they do. Um, my understanding is that they provide administrative support for all of the departments included in this group, but how that translates to over $400 million, that is not clear to me and the county lacks a lot of transparency um, in that regard and in, when it comes to its budget. Um, so I, that's my response to that. And there was also a question about what is included in sheriff. Um, the graph where it says sheriff, that's the budget for the sheriff's department. So that includes the salaries of sheriff deputies um, and the administrative costs of um, county jails. Again, when it comes to more detail on what is included in the sheriff's budget, that's another, the county doesn't provide us with that information because it, there's a lot of issues when it comes to transparency around the county budget. Um, I will say that's why one of our demands this year as a coalition is asking for um, a detailed breakdown of one, the county's spending to address COVID-19 and, and also around this, the sheriff department's budget because we have been asking for this information for a long time and we haven't got it. Um, we've been asking for even a detailed breakdown of the county budget overall on a programmatic level. So not just which department receives how X amount of money, but how much money goes into providing certain programs. So like not just, okay, HHSA department receives $2 billion, but how much money is spent on section eight vouchers? We, we can't even get that information from the county. Um, someone said you showed the five district county government leaders. Are those the only ones up for election? I think that's a great question. I, I think someone else would be better equipped to answer that because the district attorney and the sheriff, I believe, are also elected positions. Also the assessor, recorder county clerk. Um, so there are a lot of key county positions that are um, not just the supervisors, but are part of county administration. Um, I'm not sure if they're up for election this year, but someone else on this panel might be able to answer that question. Um. So Angelina, we can definitely answer that question um, in when we have a little bit more time. Why don't we go ahead and move down to let um, Dave go next, if that's okay. And again, we'll, be, we'll have an opportunity to respond to more of your questions. So Dave Laxine from uh, Political Director at SCA. I wonder. Okay, uh, hopefully folks can hear me. So if you could just um, let me know if you're able to hear me. My name is Dave Lagstein. I am uh, delighted to represent the members of SCIU 221, over 10,000 county employees that are on the front lines of uh, supporting county services. And of course, like it's more difficult during the COVID crisis. I do want to ask, I see a lot of uh, SIU members um, that are on this call. So if you want to say hello during the chat room, and I also want to give an acknowledgement to Nora Vargas, candidate for uh, Supervisor District 1, who has joined us. So if you want to say hello in the chat room as well. Um, so what I've been asked to do is to give a little bit of the Hall of Shame of the San Diego Board of Supervisors um, about some of the things that they've done that are not sort of supporting our vision of what we need. These priorities are not our priorities. And let's go to the next slide. All right, and I think there's like a, a big thing when we talk about these problems across the board, we look at the unrestricted general funds as a percentage of expenditures and these are the reserves. And we have a problem both we saw during the great recession and of course we're in another recession or depression depending on how you think about it. Um, our board of supervisors has historically when we're, we're having problems, instead of actually investing in the workforce and investing in families, we're putting money into the reserves. Um, economic experts say that we need to say, well, 10 or 15% is what's an appropriate amount of time. We're at 46%, which is wildly above what we actually need. And of course, we wanna make an argument that this money goes to support our workforce and goes to support our community. 
um, my video is, I'm seeing a note. Um, I am going to turn off my video so you can just hear me. Okay, and you can let me know in the chat room if this is helpful or not. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, another thing our Board of Supervisors do, they join the anti-immigrant Trump lawsuit. Um, they voted three to one to support the Trump lawsuit against California sanctuary laws. Um, this was the California Values Act, which was important state legislation to support our immigrant families. Um, we see this treat, this uh, tweet from Donald Trump. So grateful to the County of San Diego for joining him. And I also want to make sure that folks know this didn't make it into the slide because it was so hot off of the press. There was a loss um, at a higher court, which basically said that this, um, this lawsuit that President Trump did was bogus. So we've actually wasted taxpayer money um, in joining Donald Trump in this lawsuit against uh, quote unquote sanctuary policies. And uh, this, is, uh, this is ridiculous. And certainly like the vote of the Board of Supervisors doesn't represent where our community is at in terms of wanting to support immigrants. They're a part of our community and in actually suing to actually go after immigrants and show racism and it's ridiculous. Let's go to the next slide, please. Another slide that's been um, an important aspect of everything that's happening, both um, in the last several years and this has been brought forward again over the last couple of weeks, um, San Diego County is still number one in prisoner deaths. We've had um, a number of suicides within our jails. We've had a number of we've had a number of deaths that have been in the hands of our law enforcement, and we've not had a, we continue to invest in poli in policing. We continue to invest in jailing, but we're not investing enough in the health and human services that our community needs in order to make sure that we are where where we need to be. So this is sort of another thing in our whole shame. Uh, next slide, please. And Leslie, I think you wanna get ready to go on mute. Um, the last thing I just wanna say is like from the perspective of SEIU members, um, as we look at this budget that is gonna be coming, we are gonna be impacted in terms of the budget, in terms of the amount of money. And the three focuses that we wanna see is pay equity and economic security and investment in public health and maintaining public services. This is not the time to put money into our reserves. This is the time to invest in our workforce and to invest in our community. Um, so now, Leslie, if you are there, you wanna go on to mute. And can you share a little bit both about your perspective as a county employee and about our efforts for Hazard Bay and how the Board of Supervisors responded? Sure, hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Okay. I'll say yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, thought I was talking into the void. So, hi, I am Leslie. I'm a librarian with the San Diego County Library System, a county employee for about um, six years now. And um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, what the libraries have been doing and our experience as county employees um, with the county COVID response. Um, so when we were all sent home, the library department was able to um, organize ourselves. We partnered with Live Well um, San Diego to curate um, the Live Well at Home um, website and vet resources for the public. We expanded upon our eBooks and added new databases um, like lynda.com and curated and developed recorded story times and book reviews for the public. All while nearly half of our staff were reassigned to drive up testing, Great Plates, 211 Parks, and Care and Shelter. So Care and Shelter took the bulk of our staff and these are the um, these are the hotels that are dedicated to people who don't have um, somewhere to self quarantine in. And the work includes, but is not limited to, entering rooms with COVID positive patients, um, some of who are sex offenders, cleaning out rooms um, of vacated patients, and handling materials that are possibly contaminated with COVID. Um, working graveyard shifts, 
and um and sorry and um very early morning shifts for coverage and so hazard pay was absolutely essential for the frontline staff that were working out of their job class and description some for as little as $13 the hour as library technicians. Driving 400 to 600 miles out of their commute and unable to claim mileage. So San Diego County Libraries service all of the unincorporated areas of the county. So we have staff that are driving from Potrero or Campo as far as Hakumba, all the way to Mission Valley to report into work as a disaster service worker. Um, the 3% hazard pay was an absolute pittance, a drop in the bucket for the County of San Diego to give to staff working in hazardous conditions. With not enough PPE and under psychological stress and out of their comfort zone, and Supervisor Desmond's described the work that our reassigned staff are doing as the work of angels, as he denied a second motion to even vote on Fletcher's proposal. We are county employees, not martyrs to be sacrificed in the name of saving a dime during a crisis. It was a slap in the face, especially after the Board of Supervisors voted for themselves a 12% raise back in October of 2019. So they do need to be held accountable and reminded that the work that they do is for us, the voters and taxpayers of County of San Diego, and that includes county staff. So thank goodness for term limits. I'm really looking forward to November. All right. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing that. And thank you for your work. And uh, we will continue to move on with the agenda for everything that's happening. And I'm not sure, Paola, or who's next. Yeah, so up next, we have Esmeralda Flores, who is a policy advocate at the ACLU. Thank you and welcome everybody. So I'm just going to talk about that during this um, some and also say at home order. In this moment, um, call for real leadership from the Board of Supervisors who were responsible for the local response to COVID-19. And although we are all facing the explicit racism has often um, driven um, government response to urgent healthcare situations have left communities of color under-resourced and underinsured, and with much higher rates of pre-existing conditions. Because of all of this, we took action to stand for our communities. Uh, we knew and quickly saw how this public health crisis exacerbated long-standing racial inequities. So we sent a letter to the county and we demanded um, a lot of things, uh, information and transparency for all, healthcare for all, access to emergency housing for the unhoused, food access for every San Diegan, protections for workers, and the release of as many people as possible from detention facilities and jails in our county. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more about our detailed recommendations and demands to the Board of Supervisors, please visit ISDF website and you can find the full letter um, there. Next slide. And then we've been advocating for all of these protections for a few months now. And sadly, but not surprisingly, the Board of Supervisors has chosen to respond to the desires of privileged San Diegans instead of addressing the health and safety concerns of San Diegans whose lives have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. We know from a very recent SANDAC report that Black and Latino populations are more than four times as likely to live in areas that have been impacted by COVID-19 and unemployment then more than two thirds of the region's black and Latino populations reside in zip codes with higher than average unemployment rates. And approximately half of black and Latino residents live in zip codes with higher average 
of COVID-19 cases. It is clear that we have to address this pandemic through a racial justice lens. Next slide. We know the virus is having a disproportionate impact on community. We also know that the workers deemed essential during this time are more likely to be black and brown and in low wage, no benefit jobs, and are more likely to have to work outside their homes and more likely to get sick from COVID-19. As a result, COVID-19 has had an even, more, uh, an even more negative impacts on Latino, Asian, and Pacific Islander and black families in San Diego. Elected officials continue to downplay these disparities. Um, so that is why we have been demanding that our county government agencies collect and release detailed data, including but not limiting to COVID-19 testing, positive cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and all of this information should be disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender identity, and whether a person is an essential worker. And we also need specific information about the unhoused and incarcerated populations in our region. The county has released certain data, but we will leave the, the additional information that we're asking for. We'll provide a clearer picture about how COVID-19 is impacting our communities. Data collection is essential. Um, we cannot manage what we do not measure. And it's really important to have this information um, as well as conversations who are, that are taking place right now about reopening should be centered around equity um, as well. But we also have some good news. Along with other partners, ISDF, um, we were able to get the county to pass a temporary eviction ordinance and invest in emergency programs. We also succeeded, and with the support of uh, Nathan Fletcher, we're able, we were able to create the Regional COVID-19 Task Force for an Equitable Recovery, which held its first meeting just today. And as I mentioned before, we are all facing the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. So we must address this pandemic through a racial justice lens and take action to protect those most uh, vulnerable during this time. No one should have to choose between endangering their health or the health of others or, and providing for their family. Therefore, we will keep fighting for economic justice for all. So please don't forget to write down your questions. Pueden escribir sus preguntas en español. Y um, I'll pass it on to Grace Martinez uh, from ACE. Hi. Hi, after, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Grace Martinez. I am the director of the San Diego ACE office. Um, I'm new to San Diego. So what's at stake? And I Grace, think um, you sound I'm really low. Could you maybe speak a little louder? Is this better? Yes. Okay. So my name is Grace Martinez. I'm the director of San Diego ACE. I'm new to San Diego. Um, I come from San Francisco, so this is a very different political world for me, as well as a resource world. But as you've heard um, from the speakers prior to me, um, is that like a lot of these things, there's a history of you know, what has not been valued and what communities have not been prioritized. And even prior to this pandemic, we have been in a situation where we have not had the resources we need, not to, not only to not just survive, but to even thrive and go beyond that. Um, next slide, please. If we think about like who is impacted, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, it is the majority of our, um, Sorry, someone asked, A stands for the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment. Um, when we think about poverty and race in San Diego, it is disproportionately people of color and um, black communities. Um, and the way that the county has responded to all our needs in terms of um, health and human resources, um, services, um, having a hospital, or even just basic needs prior to the pandemic, we know that the county and many of our supervisors have either ignored or um, not either ignored, completely ignored or just undervalued the needs and demands that we've made in the past. Um, as you can see in this chart, like um, when we break down race and poverty, there's an intersection between like who is impacted and who needs most, who needs the most in, in a lot of what the county can provide. Next slide, please. So just to be funny about this, the way that we, you know, what is an equitable recovery now? So a system that we prior, we had prior to the pandemic 
was not something that supported our communities, right? We, from the very beginning, um, we have not had the budget that actually valued, um, valued health for our communities, valued, um, you know, equitable, um, I wouldn't say policing is equitable in any way, but real services to our community, food access, housing. And in the past, what the county has really focused on has been, um, you know, prioritizing a different set of community, a privileged few. Um, you see a horse there because um, one supervisor who I won't name um, in the last budget cycle was very clear as 400 families came in and spoke and testified at a county board of supervisor hearing how they needed more funding for housing and for more resources. Um, the supervisor was very clear that there wasn't enough money in the budget and um, if you know not everyone could get what they needed she wanted three million dollars for an equestrian park but not everyone could get everything so you know these are the priorities of our current supervisors and what we really have to demand is think, thinking about what our communities need to survive even beyond this pandemic so i guess the next um, part of it so no horses um, nothing against horses but if we're going to fight for horse parks um, we should make sure that we parks in our neighborhood are also working you know and we have to think about what we need what are our demands are Ca san diego county is one of the few counties in the state of california for a city a county this large and it has no public hospital so next slide so as we move forward, we have to think about like not just what we need in this, you know, right during this pandemic, but the very things that we're going to need to, you know, not just re to recover and to continue to th um, and also have a pathway towards not just surviving, but also thriving. We, we have been asking, as you've seen in the demands, economic security for everyone. And that's, you know, making sure that we have affordable housing access to um, tenants counseling, and at this time, rental assistance. We need equitable justice and justice for everyone. Um, making sure that workers are protected and not having to choose between food and rent or having to choose between um, rent, having to pay rent, and also being put in a work position that um, impacts their health and threatens their health. And you know, healthcare for all during this time in the last, like, I think in the last day, we've seen that the coronavirus um, cases have surged to 4,000. Um, and it is a challenging time for a lot of our communities, of, um, our communities that don't have access to affordable healthcare. And one um, glaring thing as we, many of us are, um, you know, struggling to get access to information is that you know, city council, not city council, county supervisor hearings are not adequately translated. And making sure that these, this information is all, is accessible to everyone um, who chooses to access it. Next slide, please. So knowing that like, we deserve more, we deserve better, and our supervisors work for us and not for, um, you know, the very, there are a few donors that uh, make sure that they're there. What is it going to take to win? Now, I think for a lot of people, we can all agree that the emergency's here, the emergency's at the door. The choices that we have to make are, um, are we're in, always in emergency mode, just making sure that we survive and are able to live. And historically, and also to take it beyond that, we're gonna have to fight and fighting in many different ways. We definitely have having power in numbers um, is one way to really build um, a force to really put pressure on elected officials to do the right thing. And one way to do that so that we can continue to, to learn about what's ha happening is definitely to be a part of the ISDF um, mailing list so you can be updated with ongoing information and also actions that we'll be taking. And the next, um, another thing that's important, and I'm hoping that if you haven't been to an action, that you will in the next like couple of weeks, but we have to bring the emergency to these, um, to our supervisor's doors. I think we're tired of having 
to make these choices. And we really have to make a lot of these supervisors who have not valued our lives, have not valued our communities to understand that we mean business and that we refuse to be ignored. So on July 7th, um, we are preparing for a care ban right prior to the Board of Supervisors meeting. If you join the mailing list, we will give you more details as it comes closer. On August 4th, um, there is another Board of Supervisors meeting where it is an opportunity for people in the um, community to weigh in. And on August 12th is the final um, budget evening budget hearing um, at 530, where this is a big showdown for many, for the community and the supervisors, the last chance for the supervisors to actually do the right thing. But as you can see, we have three events, and I think in between the 7th and the 12th, we really, as a community, as individuals, and as groups, how are we going to keep this, um, the pressure up, and how do we keep this in the press to make sure that our communities are protected, our workers have what they need, our, um, our undocumented and documented communities have access to all this information and are able to really you know, have the, the things that our children, our seniors, and our communities not have just been asking for, but deserve in order to thrive. So um, next, next page. So as a reminder, as we continue on, um, you know, planning more actions, um, we have today is the ISDF virtual town hall as a way for people to understand um, just the process and what the budget priorities are, what, where the budget has been prioritized prior. And today is our ability, we start figuring out how we change that. There is an action on July 7th, um, county group budget department proposals are due where county departments are proposing what actually they would like to see in the budget and different parts of um, just the process in order to make sure we can influence the supervisors and the county to invest in our communities and truly have a people's budget. Next slide. And for me, that's it, but I'm hoping I <laughs> did this well. But the idea here is like, just a reminder that we as a community have to be educated and also think about like, what is it gonna take to really put pressure on our supervisors and win the budget that our communities have been demanding for years and also the budget that is really gonna invest in our people, especially during this time. All right, next slide, please. So there is definitely a lot at stake. And so we wanna take this time, you know, there, we just went over the timeline. You all heard a little bit of history about the county and the role that they've played and, and how really how important they are in our lives and just how much power they hold and how little um, they, you know, they've um, been wanting to, to hand over to the people that they represent. So it is gonna be incredibly important that, um, you know, we, we link arms, right, and, and join in on, on this action that Grace is talking about. So um, what I would like to do here is, I know there's lots of questions in the chat and we've got some of our panelists that are, you know, that we have a lot of our panelists that are still on. So we're, we're gonna, go to that question. And so for the panelists, if you could turn your um, videos back on, I'm going to provide some questions and, and send them over your way. So one of the questions that um, was asked is, do we know how much federal funding goes into public safety? Is it similar to how much goes into HSSA? So HHSA? So I think this question is probably uh, more geared towards uh, Angelina. Angelina, would you take a stab at this one? Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to respond to some of the Q&A questions, so I missed that. C could you repeat it? Yes, the question was, do we know how much federal funding goes into public safety? Is it similar to how much goes into HHSA? Hmm. Amy Cruz would like to answer this question live. Go ahead, Grace. Sorry, I was, that was a mistake. Sorry, y'all. Oh. 
Um, so I don't know exactly, but I will say that HHSA gets a lot of state and federal funding and a lot more than the public safety department. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how much state and federal revenue the public safety department gets, but they do receive, I think around $700 million of general purpose revenue. So 700 minus 2.1 billion. So there's still over $1.5 billion of the public safety budget um, that comes from sources that are not general purpose revenue. So I can't say that it's state or federal revenue because I'd have to dig through the budget document, but um, I hope that like gives some answer. I'm sorry I didn't, wasn't prepared to answer that. No, thank you, Angelina. I think that's helpful. There's another question that says, does ISDF have a specific budget target for immigrant rights? How likely will the count, how likely my chair just fell um, or went all the way down? Uh, sorry, does ISDF have, have a specific budget target for immigrant rights? How likely will a county office for immigrant and refugee affairs be established to further facilitate and invest in immigrant integration? Ifmit, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, as ISDF, we don't have a specific budget. As you could tell from the presentation, it is one of the priorities that we have um, under uh, one of the the issue area that's a priority for, for our work. Um, but we are advocating for an office of immigrants um, such as LA, Seattle, um, and New York City that could serve as a one. Um, right now we do have some services um, who there are, in, there are director to the refugee community, um, refugee community, community uh, but we want a, a, an office that could put together all of this um, services that are available. And we saw, um, we saw with this health crisis, how language access has been a, a, a big issue for our communities to get the vital information that they need during this time and how they need to be thinking outside of the box to reach out to all of our communities here in, um, in San Diego and how just like a daily press conference um, isn't enough to get the information out there. Um, so that is one of the priorities that we're gonna be asking um, and advocating for during this budget cycle, um, the creation of, of the office. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to succeed. Yes, thank you, Esme. We will succeed. Um, one, the other, another question is, of the $6.5 billion budget, how much reserves do we have? And this is a question for Angelina, and I know the reserves have been a huge topic of discussion. Um, Angelina, do you want to take a stab at this? Yeah, I don't, about the total reserves, I'm not sure. Um, what we tend to focus on are the general fund reserves. Um, of the general fund reserves, sorry, let me. Sorry, I'm trying to pull this information up. Uh, so I think, okay, of the general, there's almost $2 billion in the county's general fund reserves um, that are considered unrestricted, I believe. I, sorry, I don't have the answer to that at this time, but I can follow up and respond later on. Yeah, so the, that figure um, has probably changed because during COVID-19, the county has uh, tapped into reserves um, but what we what we do know is that in in the analysis that we had before, as Angelina mentioned, there were almost two billion dollars um, in reserves that could have gone or could, could continue to go towards vital services. So of the fifty million dollars that Sean spoke about earlier in, on our call, um, 
the $25 million were taken out one year and another $25 million were taken out of reserves the second year. But um, even if you subtract, right, $25 million, it's a drop in the bucket compared to how much money was in reserve. So although um, the county has tapped into that reserve to respond to COVID-19, as Angelina mentioned, we still don't have um, a good way to really understand what that budget and what the spending has looked like. So again, I think part of, um, part of the important thing to remember here is that what we need is to be able to push for the county to be more transparent and accessible so that we can actually have access to these questions. So um, just wanted to add to that. There was a question around actions that I thought uh, Grace could probably answer to this. It said, um, of the actions that are coming up, um, like caravans, where did I see this question? Um, like what are they? I just typed it, Paula. Oh, go yeah, ahead. I, I think the question was, um, are there going to be any in, uh, in-person actions or are they, is it just caravans? So on um, July 7th, I think there will be an opportunity for both the caravan and for an in-place action, um, an in-person action. We do want to make sure that we are being um, safe during this time because we are still in the first wave. And as I mentioned before, we're seeing a lot more cases now, um, now that there's been some slow reopening. Um, I think for July 7th, we are still in the planning stages, but that will also be a supervisor hearing that we all have to weigh in on. And there are, um, there is a plan to actually have escalating actions between in the month of July before another set of county supervisor hearings in order to make sure we keep the pressure up. But the best way to find out is to actually join the ISVF mailing list um, so that we can loop everyone in. Yes, thanks, Grace. So there's a question, um, and I don't know if maybe Dave or um, maybe Sean would want to take this one on. How, does, how do census results affect the budget? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Oh. Sean, are you say can you say something? We we could hear you and then we couldn't. Okay. Does someone, as, as Sean is um, working through his sound, does anyone else want to take this? This is an important question. I know some of our partners have been doing a lot of work on the census. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I was expecting someone else to answer. Yeah, so it, the question is, how does the census, how does census results affect COVID? How will census impact COVID? The county budget. Oh, Sean's back on, so I'm... <laughs> Grace, do you want to take it? <laughs> no, thanks. Okay. Well, actually, so um, Sophia um, from our team, um, she responded in, in the chat, I, I noticed. Um, so, you know, the, the way that money is allocated, and I'm not a full blown expert on this, but the, the, the way that the money is allocated is based on how many, um, yeah, that's ex exactly, Sophia. It's, it is important that we're all counted. So um, the way that money is allocated is based on population oftentimes. And without having a, um, an accurate count, um, it is unlikely that we're going to get the funds that we need to get. But what's really important to know about the way that the counting is done is that oftentimes, it's, um, it is our, our Black, our Indigenous, our communities of color that are, are often not counted um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, and then also because of the, the variety of, of um, scare tactics that the Trump administration has put into place over the last several years, 
um, there has been a lot of fear that um, folks from our undocumented community, um, immigrants, refugees, um, would be afraid to fill out the census. And what really, what happens when, that, when, when folks don't fill out the census is that we don't get an accurate uh, amount of distribution to our communities. As you all have been hearing over and over again, as it stands, and not enough money is flowing into our communities, and that'll only get worse if we're not counted. All right, thank you, Sean. There was a, there was a comment made by one of our um, participants in Spanish. Hola, yo quiero que mi dinero se gaste la mitad, que se use ahorita, que, que se use ahorita la mitad de lo que se está dando al sheriff, y lo demás en programas educativos para las escuelas y psicólogos y, uh, y terapias para jóvenes y en programas de las en las organizaciones que trabajan con la comunidad y con los jóvenes. So translated into English, um, our participant is saying, I want half of the money that's being spent on the sheriff to go towards programs, edu um, educational programs for schools, um, for um, mental health, uh, for um, youth programs and and organizations that help with community and youth is uh, the comment that was made in the in the channel. It, there's another question. Oh, Grace, this question is for you. In Spanish, someone is asking. ¿Cuál es la dirección para la acción del 7 de julio? So what is the address of the July 7th action? So um, I'm sorry, we're still planning it. And I think to get on the mailing list is the first thing. Um, we are planning to have it at the Board of Supervisors um, where it's still unclear where they're going to have it. I think my understanding is the Pacific Highway um, location. So we still have to confirm many things before we tell out the whole world, but we hope to have that um, by the beginning of next week. Yes, and to add to that, the... So to add to that, um, the, although, so the action will take place at the, the, you know, at a building for those who are able to join in person, but there is an opportunity for comments to be made um, online through the e-comment uh, section or through the e-comment um, that the, the supervisors, uh, the County Board of Supervisors currently offers. So um, the action will be um, early in the morning. It'll be probably, um, it'll actually be around eight o'clock with a uh, a press conference and then after at nine o'clock the board of supervisors meeting starts and at that point we would like what we're asking is for community members to call in and tell them how you want your how you want the county budget uh, to reflect the needs of your community so the um that meeting is again july 7th at 9 a.m and so you have the ability to um, sign up now on the county website so that you get that um, agenda. But we will also be sharing out talking points and sharing uh, the larger list of demands that we will be um, pushing for, right? So for, for the comments that were made about uh, moving money away from uh, the sheriff's department, if that's what our communities want, then that's, those are the opportunities for us to get to the Board of Supervisors and, and tell them um, what instead we want our money spent on. Okay, and I'm just gonna, um, we're about out of time. There's a question, um, and this will be our last question. Um, the question is, where does the county money, where does the, where does the county get money from? From the state, federal government, or both? And I definitely think that this is um, an Angelina question. Hi, yeah, sorry. So um, 20, about 29%, so 1.8 billion comes from the state about 13, 14%, about 853 million comes from the federal government. Um, about 21%, so 1.3 billion comes from property 
and other taxes. Um, and those are the some of the major funding sources. And then some other sources are uh, transfers between funds so the that the county already has, charges for services, fees, and fines. So like money that the county collects from parking meters or library late fees or uh, business licensing fees, health and permitting fees, things like that. Um, yeah. Thank you for that, Angelina. Um, for the panelists that are still um, that are are still with us, would you like to add anything as we as we close this meeting? Go ahead, Sean. Yeah. So um, I just one of the the comments that was made about funding education and um, you know diverting funding from from uh, law enforcement or incarceration into, into education. Um, I just want to acknowledge that because a, a lot of times when we engage in our budget advocacy, we're told what we can and can't spend money on. We're told, uh, well, the county pays for this. It doesn't pay for that. It's your money. It's our money. And so um, it's really, really important that we don't allow, um, allow the county to continue to define spending in, in ways that don't match our values. Um, as Angelina like really, really powerfully put, it is a moral document. And when our community is saying, please help pay for education instead of these other things, um, and they're not hearing us, they're not listening to us or, and they're ignoring us, I think it's super, super important that we just, we, we don't accept that rationale that that's not the way things uh, are supposed to work. Um, if this is our money, um, this is our community, and we should be defining the way the money is spent. And so I just, that one really, really resonates with me because every time we do advocacy, whether it's the city, the county, wherever, community is always asking for more money to be spent on, on education. And um, you all can show up and demand that. And the more often they hear it, the, the, the less accept, uh, acceptable it will be for them to say no. So I just want to, again, lift that up and appreciate that you all um, showed up and are asking the questions that you're asking. All right, Sean, thank you very much for that. Anyone else want to chime in? We've got one minute left. No, okay, well, if, if there's nothing else, again, remember to sign up to make sure that you're signed up for to receive all of our emails. Follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we will be posting lots of important information there on upcoming events. And we will hopefully be seeing you active and ready to fight because if we don't, right, no one will. So thank you all and um, power to you. We'll be, we'll be in touch. And again, thank you all for joining.